tonight. Yale's radical past comes to light. Sterling Library shows us why the Black Panther protests are still alive today. Plus, openly gay professional athletes are making national news. So what's the news on gay athletes at Yale? Stay right here to learn more. Stay tuned for these stories and more because it's your Yale, your week, and your news. Hello and welcome to YTV. I'm Raleigh Cavero and today is March 7th, 2014. To begin, we'll go to Madison Allworth in the newsroom for this week's headlines. Thanks, Raleigh. Two years ago, the introduction of fall break led to a shortened reading period and more stressful exam schedules for Yaleys. Well, this week the administration announced that one day will be added on to reading period in both semesters next year. To compensate, winter break and the period between the end of classes and commencement will be cut down by one day each. The YCC, which had advocated for two days to be added, has promised to continue pushing for expansions of reading week. Last week, for the first time in over 20 years, the New Haven City budget was pitched by someone other than John DeStefano Jr. Newly elected Mayor Tony Hart proposed a $510.8 million budget, representing a 2.7 increase from last year's budget. The budget growth will primarily be paid for by increasing property taxes. According to HARP, the increase stems mostly from rising fixed costs, such as debt service and pension liabilities. The budget now moves on to the Board of Alders Finance Committee, where it will be revised before a final vote by the full board. And with the recent announcement of new grading policies at the School of Management, undergrads aren't the only ones up in arms about grading reform. The changes at SOM begin by renaming the grading categories and adding a fifth category. Currently, students can receive grades of distinction, proficient, pass, or fail. In addition, student transcripts will now list each student's complete academic record, not just his top grades. The cherry on top is a new curve which will cap the percentage of students that can receive each grade. Controversy has ensued at SOM with students claiming that their input in the final solution was limited. The new policies will be implemented in fall of 2014. Last Sunday, while some Yaleys were studying for midterms, five others were being arrested on the White House lawn. The arrest occurred after the group participated in a protest against the Keystone XL pipeline. The demonstration drew 1,000 people in total. 200 participants zip-tied their wrists to the White House fence, and hundreds more staged a symbolic human oil spill on a large black tarp. All the students participating were made aware of civil disobedience protocol and its legal implications the night before the protest by the DC Action Lab. After spending the entire afternoon protesting, the students were handcuffed and detained around 6 p.m. For some in New Haven, that last story might bring back memories of past protests here at Yale. In the 1970s, the Black Panther New Haven chapter held protests that shocked the campus and city for days. Joseph Benson and Lily Rifkin bring us an eyewitness account of what that was like and give us more insight to the exhibit that's going on right now at Sterling Library entitled Panther and Bulldog. We go to them for more. In May of 1970, the New Haven Nine, nine Black Panther Party members were on trial for the kidnapping and killing of fellow Panther Alex Rackley. They suspected he was an informant for the FBI, but this was not the only cause of the civil unrest. Um. There were two members of the New Haven Panther Party, who I knew personally, who were in the back of the room, and they were very quietly reading, each reading a newspaper. In the rest of the courtroom, there were white people, many of whom were chatting with each other, making noise, uh, bustling about doing things. And for reasons w no one ever understood, Judge Mulvey slammed his gavel down and found the two black men in contempt of court and put them in jail. And that kind of exploded on the scene, and that was what caused President Brewster to say that he was sad that he had a feeling a black person could not get a fair trial in, in 
in the United States. News soon broke that tens of thousands of Panthers, supporters and radicals would arrive in New Haven to protest. It drew in a lot of people. I mean, I don't know if you know or not, but there, but like Jerry Rubin, who was one of the Yippies, the Youth International Party members, had given a speech in Boston at the beginning of April where he was saying that they were, you know, there were going to be 500,000 people descending on New Haven and they were coming to burn Yale. What happened at other institutions who tried to keep radicals out, and the result was that people were arrested, people were badly, seriously hurt, buildings were burned. We decided to take a different point of view and we decided to allow the radicals to come onto the campus. The second part was that we engaged in an enormous amount of pre-planning, which was not just Yale, it was the New Haven Police Department, the National Guard, the U.S. Attorney General's Office, a whole series of people, and the planning turned out to be good planning, and so nothing happened. Kingman Brewster had a handle on a little piece of this, but there was a much bigger context that he didn't really have a handle on, and I think he really thought, it becomes clear when you read his stuff, he thought that, he, I mean, he basically sat in a, in a control room over off the green over by Elihu somewhere, I think maybe Henry Hall, I'm not sure exactly where it was, um, thinking that if anything happened and anybody died, that was going to be the end of his presidency of Yale. From the residential colleges to individual students, Yale readied itself and participated in the protests. Students didn't know what was going to happen. Now, we offered any students who wanted to the opportunity to go home. It turned out very, very few students availed themselves of it. We secondly tried to get the students involved. So, for example, each residential college, which was going to be open and filled with radical people, was given a special assignment. So Pearson College was the first aid college. At the same time to support the close, you know, this moratorium on classes that was that was established, Yale students organized themselves to go out in the community and do these things they call teach outs. Um, where they go out and interview community members and talk about the issues about the trial and things like that. So, so there's a lot of, um, it wasn't just from, from the Yale student perspective, I think it wasn't just, uh, oh, we don't have classes and, and there's all these people coming to burn down our school. Um, there was a lot of engagement around the issues with, with members of the community. Right on New Haven Green 30 years ago, the New Haven protests ended peacefully two days after they started. They left their mark. Yale saw that the old ways of dealing with the young and radical were outdated and there needed to be a change. With authority. They saw authority as not being interested in the future and in the, and you. So one of the things that President Brewster had decided was that because someone was protesting didn't make them bad and that you really ought to listen to what they were saying so that <clears throat> during the course of not only the, the um, period around May Day and the Panther trial, but during the period before and after, it was his philosophy, and therefore our philosophy, that if a person came in and challenged us, we'll listen. This cultural legacy inspired Yale to construct a Panther and Bulldog exhibit this semester. On display are FBI documents, Black Panther period t-shirts, and photos of massive protests. Yeah, doing an exhibit on something that's relatively contemporary and where there are still people alive is really fascinating. And, you know, it allows, it allows students in various classes to engage with them as well. YTV, this has been Joseph Vinson and Lily Rifkin. The exhibit will be open until May 16th and is already sparking renewed conversation on campus. Just last week, Pearson College hosted a master's tea and also Yale historian Beverly Gage moderated a conversation on the Black Panthers and the FBI. That event included John Williams, a New Haven attorney and legal activist who represented several of the original New Haven Nine defendants. I think it's so interesting that we have this lens to look at a really a national story, such a national movement, but look at it specifically in terms of New Haven and have that accessible to students. It's wonderful and also, you know, we have people who were alive at that time and now can just really bring this to life for us and that's just such a cool story. Thanks guys. Um, in more national news, a little more current, uh, you may have heard of Jason Collins and Michael Sam. 
Collins currently plays for the Brooklyn Nets, and Sam will likely be drafted into the NFL this year. What these two men have in common, outside of their superior athleticism, is that they are both openly gay. Collins is the first publicly gay athlete to compete in the NBA, and Sam could be the first active player in the NFL to have come out publicly as gay. So with these two national examples, we investigated what life is like here at Yale for openly gay athletes. Reporters Alero Egbe and Michael Leopold bring us more. With a nickname like the Gay Ivy, it seems Yale would be a haven for gay athletes. But it might not be that simple. Senior Cole Flory is the only openly gay athlete on the men's swimming and diving team. And when Maria Templer arrived here to work with the LGBTQ office, there were no openly gay athletes on any team. How many out athletes do you have? Oh, we don't have any right now. Oh, well, how many have you had in the past few years? Oh, we haven't actually had any out athletes on this team in a few years, but if they were there, I'm sure they would feel comfortable. And I just sort of said, you know, it's kind of not a great sign. One of the issues that they said really makes people feel like it's not safe to come out is that there are um, uh, uses of um, the word faggot and gay in ways that um, a gay person might find hostile. But on teams with gay athletes like Yale men's swimming and diving team, offensive language is simply not tolerated. Sometimes people come in uh, and they'll kind of they'll say, you know, the usual kind of slurs and things like that, and that got stopped almost immediately. While the swimming and diving coaches could not be reached for comment, Captain Edward Becker emphasized that its members are teammates first and foremost. We've really developed kind of a close-knit uh, group, and that way, you know, you can really define personal relationships, uh, so you know someone as a person uh, long before they come out. Diver Cole Flory was out his freshman year before joining the team as a sophomore. I think a lot of people on the team either knew or just sort of assumed. That might be why Flory's life as a gay athlete at Yale has gone smoothly. In like team conversations, like team like hot seat and tough stuff like that, like I just told people, I think I said one time, like you can ask me the same exact questions you can ask anyone else. Like, cool. And it went from there. I have, made my role on the team like I am the same as everyone else I don't need extra support I don't need less support I am me and that's fine and I am confident and that's great and I think everybody respects that this is good news for Maria Templer's office who has tried to create an athletic community where issues are addressed and prevented before they can build we haven't had yet a transgender varsity athlete um, but Amy and I have worked to make sure that should we have one I can't promise that everything is in place, but many, many things are in place. With an office dedicated to ensuring seamless transitions for LGBTQ athletes on campus, and captains and teammates committed to respectful language, positive inter-team relationships, and, well, pride, Yale may soon see more and more of its athletes out and proud. For YTV, this has been Michael Leopold and Alero Egbe. Cole just finished his final season with the team, which placed fourth in this week's weekend's Ivy League tournament. And we leave you with our Everybody Has a Story segment. This week, Cody sat down with undergraduates Jessica Garland and Nia Holston to discuss the Yale Undergraduate Prison Project. They discussed how we view incarceration here in New Haven and across the country. Here are a few highlights from that interview. Hi, welcome to YTV and this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story. Jessica Garland is a junior in Davenport College and Nia Holston is a senior in Jonathan Edwards College and they're here today to tell us about their experiences with prison education, reform, and policy through their work at the Yale Undergraduate Prison Project. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So the Yale Undergraduate Prison Project, this is, this is a, a relatively new uh, thing at Yale. Can you tell me how this started, where the idea came from, and how you guys got this off the ground? Yeah, so uh, starting freshman year, I became part of an organization called the Manson Education Initiative, and that's been going on for about eight years. Uh, students go every Saturday and Sunday to Manson Youth Prison in Cheshire, Connecticut and help uh, young men there prepare for their GDs. So it's a men's youth prison, so from about 14 to 21 year olds we're working with. Um, and that was a relatively small program and we didn't really have anything besides tutoring involved with that. Then uh, at the end of uh, December or November of last year, Mia decided that we should move beyond just tutoring and do advocacy and awareness as well and started a mass incarceration discussion group. Mm -hmm. Right, so I um, previously was the Black Student Alliance at Yale um, uh, Political Action Chair, 
Um, and so I, what I really found that was missing about a lot of the dialogue at Yale is that there were a lot of people who were interested or becoming interested in mass incarceration issues, um, but there wasn't any space to have a dialogue about those issues and the, the various manifestations that they have. Um, so I um, uh, created the Mass Incarceration Discussion Group. Um, so it's just a small, like, informal meeting of people who were interested um, and people that I knew. And what I realized were most, the most of the people who came out uh, to the event were from Manson Education Education Initiative. And so I think at the same time that you know Manson was thinking about you know making this a larger a larger widespread thing, I was looking for a way to formalize the formalize the discussion group. And so we just kind of combined, and it worked really well together. So I, I became their advocacy chair. Now, the women's prison in, in Danbury, I understand it, was the basis for uh, Piper Kerman's memoir, Orange is the New Black, which was made into the, the hit Netflix TV show. She was incarcerated in Danbury. Have you seen a, a spike in interest in, in prison reform, these issues with shows like Orange is the New Black? And do you think that those shows and, and her memoir have promoted the right perception about prison and women in prison? So we were doing a lot of advocacy work about the Danbury issue, um, and this isn't an issue that a lot of people were aware of, uh, so we asked Piper Kerman to come speak at Yale, and she spoke and it was incredible and got a lot of people to come listen and learn not only about the Danbury prison issue, but also about mass incarceration in general, and in particular uh, women who are incarcerated. Uh, I think, so through that, there was a definite spike in the interest in this issue and how many people volunteered to help us out after she came. So that was incredibly beneficial for our, the movement, I think. Uh, yeah, so definitely. So I think Jesse's right. I think there's always a danger uh, with telling a story um, in a television format of not telling the whole story or not tell it, or telling an imperfect story. Um, but it was a necessary one, and I'm so glad that it was that it was able to be produced on major television. And I have seen a spike in the people who are interested um, in talking about this issue. And you know, Piper Kerman himself was you know one of the first people to say, "Hey, this is my story, and I'm going to tell it." But this doesn't mean that the racial disparities in prisons aren't very apparent, and that Black and Latino and uh, people of color aren't grossly overrepresented um, in our mass, um, in our system of incarceration in this country. And so that's a vital story that needs to be told. This is one story, but hopefully it, it can uh, be a gateway for more stories. And there are so many stories that are so important and so vital that need to be told. So playing off some of those issues, uh, Nelson Mandela, who, who recently passed away in December, popularized the following quote, uh, which is, it is said that no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails, end quote. Now you two have had a unique opportunity to be inside these prisons, to work with these prisoners. What would you want Yale students to know about the experiences that you've seen? So what we hear from a lot of the young men and women that we work with is that no matter how many tests they pass or books they read, they won't be able to get a good job when they get out or enough to make enough money to support their family. And that's because of the stigmatization that comes with having a record and also the inability to get a good job because when you apply for most jobs, there's a question on the application that says whether or not you failed to have spent time in prison. You need to fill that out. Um, New Haven recently in 2011 um, actually passed a law saying that it's not allowed on public applications, which is wonderful and allows people a much more fair chance of getting uh, good jobs in the city. Um, that's a movement that's spreading across the country. It's called Ban the Box, but it hasn't happened everywhere yet. Um, but I think that's the number one thing, is just to understand that these people are actual people and um, the effects of what, how you think about them can hamper their lives and uh, their ability to move forward. So I just want to end, it, you know, the title of this segment is Everybody Has a Story. And you both have encountered, I imagine, lots of stories with your work with these prisoners. Is there one that sticks out in your mind that, that you know, you're, you're proud of or, or taught you a very important lesson about the work you do? So my favorite part of tutoring is teaching a class that I teach with Ezra Richin at the New Haven Jail, which is about a 10 minute walk from where we are right now at the Yale Daily News. And it's a class that we teach people on how to read by reading rap songs. And originally we were doing reading by reading the GD books and the necessary material, materials for that, and people really weren't that interested in it, and understandably so, because the material did relate to their lives. So we started teaching a class on how to read by reading rap songs, and that really struck a chord with a lot of the young men that we work with, because they can really relate to what they're doing, and um, they've improved a lot, and that's really inspiring. Right, so I've um, been lucky enough to participate in uh, several voter registration drives um, 
for uh, persons with uh, convictions. And one of the things that um, has definitely stuck out to me is that how so many people uh, with which, you know, the what's out there in the media is that, you know, these people don't want to vote anyway and they don't deserve the right to vote. Um, but how so many people who came up to me, you know, really didn't, didn't know that they had the right to vote, but when I told them that they did, um, that changed everything. And they were so engaged and actually um, through the, uh, through the voter registration drive that the city of New Haven did two years ago in 2012, we the the voter uh, they actually had a 54 percent voter turnout of the people that we registered, and so that's pretty that's pretty high compared to the to the national average I think or so and it will, and shouldn't be surprising because so many people care and like are so much more than their criminal record so that's what I would say. Jessica Garland, Nia Holston, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. <laughs> And as always, thank you for joining us for YTV. I'm Cody Pomerantz. We'll see you after spring break where you can look for more interviews with General Stanley McChrystal and global health expert Professor Elizabeth Bradley here at Yale. See you next time. Thanks. To see the full interview, go to the YTV website under the features page. And that is it for us tonight. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you after the two-week spring break on Friday, March 28th. We hope you enjoy your time off as much as these Yaleys are planning to. <laughs> It's your Yale, your week, and your news. Midterms, snow, students are getting sick of this. I came to Cross Campus to ask people about their plans for spring break. What are you doing over spring break? Going to a warm place. I'm going to my homeland, Delaware. I'm going home to Boston. You're going home to Boston? Spring break! <laughs> um, I'm going on the Glee Club tour to Cuba. And what are you most looking forward to about break? Just looking forward to sleep. Sleep. I'm sure you get that answer on my couch, sleep. I'm looking forward to sleeping. In Miami, I plan on sleeping on the beach all the time. What are you most excited for? Uh, my cat. Oh! Yes. What's your cat's His name? His name is Cookie. Uh, my cats. Your cats? Yeah. <laughs> That's what Facebook, but he's not very active on it. Well, if you want to get some followers. <laughs> uh, Cookie Fabian. C-O-O. K. <laughs> Spelled like the cookie. <laughs> like the cookie. <laughs> yeah. What do you know? Hopefully this mess will be gone when we get back. Have a great spring break, everyone. I'm Leah Motzkin. This has been Weekend Take Two for YTV.